Well, this morning we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking in particular at verse 6. Now, I know it's been a week or so since we have, uh, have been into this uh, study, but I think it's going to be easy to pick right back up where we left off. And look, there's something in here for everyone. I know you've probably heard that before. Um, people who teach always try to make the things that they want to get across uh, receivable by the people that hear them. And uh, in looking at this message, there's certainly no way around it. It covers everyone in the world. Everyone, whether they believe in God, whether they have trusted in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of the world, or if they haven't done. There, there is something for everyone, literally, in, in the Word of God. Of course, we know that there is a disposition of God in all of this uh, matter. So when we talk about His return, when we talk about His first coming, even, there is a disposition of God. That is, God has a purpose he has a desire when he does something. His wisdom is far above ours. Um, I, I was over talking to Merv uh, this week and, and I told him that, that even in some of the very simple things that God has done in man, creating man, they're wonders. They're just, just unbelievable things that are processes that continue on in our bodies every single day. We don't think about them. We don't even understand them. Uh, maybe some physicians do, but we're certainly uh, no physicians here. Um, we don't understand them, but yet they still happen. God, God has a disposition in what he does. When he came the first time, there was a purpose, wasn't there? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now in that first uh, coming, in the desire and, and, and purposes of God, some men thought that this savior was only for the Jewish nation. Why would they think that? Because Christ came through that lineage. He came through that, uh, that line of things. And so some wanted to hoard this great savior of the world to themselves. And of course, it was evidenced by God through the prophets and through time after that it was not just for one nation, but it was for all the peoples of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, why this is so important is because this is one of those passages, this is one of those verses upon which hangs everything in the balance. Everything hangs upon this verse because the belief in that verse and what it teaches, the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, changes one's uh, destiny, changes one's person, changes who we are, makes a radical change. I started out talking about the body and how there are processes in the body that we don't understand. How does your heart keep beating, keeping you alive? Do you worry about that at night? Do you do like I do sometimes when you sit there and you know you can, you can feel your heart beat, thump, 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 and it's, you don't think about it all the time, and yet it happens, right? Uh, we, we consume food, and, and the food is turned into energy. Uh, the food supplies energy to every cell of our body. I don't know how that happens. I know it does happen, and I know I, I hunger probably more than I ought to, and I probably eat, I know, more than I need the energy. <laughs> but still, we, there are things we don't understand, and yet we, uh, we take them for granted. That, that's, I guess, the best way to put it. We understand that they work only because we see the results of them. The new birth is much like that, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Uh, I was privileged this week to see that, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ reaching down and saving someone. Uh, Jeremiah, who's here with us today, was saved just this week. Calling, calling on the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing his sin, that he, he was in need of a Savior, and calling on the Lord who paid the debt for sin to forgive him. And so the transaction was done. The transaction was done because God has a, dis, a disposition to save. He's not willing that any should perish. That's what the Bible says but that all should come to repentance. Don't, so do we see there's a, there's a purpose with God? God is not like he's been painted by so many religions and, and, and so many unbelievers, to be quite honest, to be the great judge in white in the sky, dispassionate, not caring, only wanting one, one way, one thing. Uh, not, not caring about our estate. That cannot be said of God. The Bible is quite clear. Before you even thought about God, and you can think back in your own life when you first contemplated if there was or wasn't a God, or you looked in the heavens maybe and you wondered how all these things came to be and did God bring them into existence. Before ere we knew God, He loved us. And I'm not talking about before Jesus came, like the verse of Scripture says that he so loved the world. Not just that world. He loved the world, those souls that are in it so much that he did not want them to perish. What does that tell you? Unfortunately, brethren, it tells us they were on their way to perishing. And he, did, he wanted to intervene. And he still does. He loves us. He loves us whether we're here today and saved and trusting in him. That's a special love, isn't it? It's the love of, 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 of brethren, of father to son. But he loves the world as well. His dispensation is toward them. He cares about them. He loves them. He's not willing that they should perish. So I want you to know that before I preach this message that God's dispensation is toward every man, every man. Because there are some hard things in the Bible, some difficult things to understand. And people will think that we're saying of God that he, he wants to bring about his justice. He wants it to be uh, dished out on everyone. And if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that that God's wrath is upon you. And while it is true that if we have not trusted in Christ, we are already condemned, that is the condemnation is there upon us, remember the love. Because he loves, he doesn't want that to stand. He wants to break that, uh, that, that uh, separational bond that's there through sin. He wants to break through that. What is the way? There's only one way. He is not willing that any should perish, and he sent his son to this earth. There's only salvation in Jesus Christ. You won't find it in another. There is no other God under heaven, and I, I say that quite deliberately. There is no other God under heaven. Although men have made other gods, I'll give you that. They've set up tokens and, and, and totems and, and templates of what they think God should be. There's only one God. And that is the God in heaven who sent his only begotten son into the world to die for the sins of the world. That's how much he loved. He loved enough to sacrifice for us. So this is the great pivotal part of the scriptures. On, on this we, we live or we die. On this we are with Christ or without him. This is the reason for all things. It's that great pinnacle and point of the word of God. Now, 
in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're getting into a verse that's going to talk about this relationship and what in the end of things is going to happen to men, dependent on which side or the other they're on. I don't think we need to remind everyone here today that we are a, a finite individual. We have a beginning and an end, right? And I mean by that, this life that we have on earth. We have a starting point, and we have an ending point. It's just, it's natural. Everyone who's gone before us has experienced that beginning and that ending point. But what if I were to tell you that death is not the end? Death is not the end for any man. Now that's an interesting truth. It is a truth because it's recorded in the Word of God. Death is not the end. There is, beyond this life, another. And what is beyond is greater than what we have here. What we have here is temporary. It, it's also, because of the sin of, of Adam, it's also tainted and, and tarnished by sin. But, but that life to come, or that, that promise to come, is not so. It's glorious. Even right now, it's glorious. Now, let's look at chapter 1, verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians. He says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with, the everla with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now I'm going to take things a little bit back to front here today. In, in this passage of scripture, we hear that the people in Thessalonica were under persecution. They, they were suffering for their faith. If, if you're worried today for instance, uh, to Jeremiah, who is the, is the newest, newest saved person that I know, to those of you who, like myself, who have been saved for 40 years and more, or uh, whoever is here who's been saved longer than that, and I'm sure there have been, we reckon that salvation, of course, from the time that we confessed our sins and that we called upon the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in his finished work and asked him to save us. That's the beginning. Do you ever play a video game? And uh, you go through your video game, uh, and, and I have played video games. I, I quite like video games. Waste a lot of time on them, but it, you can do anyway. But what's interesting is when you defeat one of those big... Uh, the big bosses in the video game, you know, the ones I'm talking about, the ones that, you know, you fight all the little enemies along the way, but then you meet up with the big boss, right? You defeat him in the video game, and it's, it's usually followed by fireworks or something, you know, something special. You know, the first thing that you do after you defeat him, you save. You save the video game because whenever you come back to the game, you can always start after that time. You don't have to go back and defeat that enemy again, do you? Once, once you've gone through that enemy, that enemy is gone. You hit the save button and it transports you back to this point, this saved location, wherever you are. That's what salvation is. There's a, there is a great enemy that we have to fight that, that is holding on to us here. And when by salvation we're delivered from so great a death, we don't do it, but God does, it's marked in time. It is the beginning of your spiritual life. 
God, God begins that spiritual life by uh, putting into you a new man. Bible's replete with talking about this. There is an old man, that's our natural self that we've grown up with. That man understands sin. He's been involved in sin. He knows it. He's, he's worldly, he's of the world. Fleshly, he's of the flesh. But there's a new man. The new man is that part of you that wants to do right, right? That, that wants to please God in all things. Now, you can't tell me if you're here and saved that you don't have that new man dwelling in you. I know you do. I know the new man is there. He can be pushed down or hidden away or put in the background or uh, turned away from, but you will never get rid of the new man created by God in you, only wants to do right, only wants to please the Lord. And so we have a conflict, don't we? We have a conflict within ourselves. The old man and the new man, just contrary, completely contrary one to the other. That's why we struggle so with sin. That's why we find it difficult to do what what God has commanded us to do because while we want to follow him, the new man wants to follow, wants to do, wants to please him in everything, the, the old man can never do so. And so we struggle. We, we have this fight in ourselves. Then why should we be so surprised that this same problem is in the world? The Thessalonians were feeling it. They were saved people in the midst of a, of a pagan world. And guess what happened? There was conflict. There was, they were diametrically opposed to each other. And so there was conflict and a persecution coming from the world upon the Christians as they endeavored simply to walk according to the, the rule and word of God. And Paul addresses this in this chapter in 1 Thessalonians, he discussed how we can get great comfort from the return of the Lord. That he said, in fact, I want you all to comfort one another with these words. That the Lord will come. He's going to descend from heaven. And he's going to raise the dead in Christ first. And then those who are alive and remain at his coming, he's going to gather them together with them. And we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. He says, comfort one another with these words. And now in 2 Thessalonians, here in chapter 1, he's comforting them by the return of the Lord again. But he's comforting them over their struggles, the persecution they're enduring. So they see these people in the world who they were a part of the world at one stage and they know what it's like to be pagan they know what it's like to uh, be bound under sin they know what that's like but now they're being persecuted by their brothers and sisters and so Paul says those of you who are troubled and that means to be under great persecution those of you who are pressed and, and put under pressure, he says, to those, rest with us. In other words, you don't have to defeat this enemy. God's going to defeat the enemies that are against him. And so he says, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. There is a coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming again. We celebrate this uh, birth of Jesus Christ. We do it as a remembrance. We're looking back to his first coming and we're thanking God that he came. We know it's a testimony of God's love for the world that that little babe in a manger grew up to become the savior. And so we're very thankful. We want to remember that. But Paul here is saying, brethren, if you're being put under pressure, rest with us. Because all of your pressures and troubles and tribulations are soon to be over 
when the Lord returns. I love the manner that he speaks of here. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed. Now there's an interesting word. There are not many Greek words that we know. A, a, a lot of times words are transliterated into English. They're not actually, maybe it's because we didn't have a good word to cover it. So we just bring the whole, the lettering across, make it, make it anglicized and then give, a, give an explanation to it. That's similar to what this word is. The word revealed here is the Greek word apocalypto. Now that, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like apocalypse, doesn't it? And when we think of the apocalypse, maybe you think of a video game, I don't know. You know, people walking around like zombies or whatnot. But the word apocalypse only means an unveiling. Something that was covered and revealed. So an apocalypse is an unveiling, an opening, if you will. Now, do you look forward to the return of the Lord? This is a, this is a good first test uh, of your salvation. We think about, as, as a saved person, I understand what I just told you about God loving the world, and so I'm part of the world, so I know He loves me. And He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, and, and I know I've believed in Him, in His work, I'm certainly not trusting in my own goodness to make it there. I've got no hope. If it's based on my goodness, even from the time I was saved, if it's based on my goodness, I'm, I'm done for. But it's not. Thankfully, it's not. It's based on the righteousness of Christ. And His righteousness is perfect. There's a, that new man in me wants to obey Him and wants to follow Him in all things. But... I know that I'm always going to have this conflict all the days of my life. Now, although I know that, there's a good first example. Are we looking forward to the Lord's coming? And you hear people talk about it all the time. You know, oh, Lord, please come quickly. You know, please come quickly. If they're in trouble or distress or body is racked by pain or or they're old and, and they just feel they're not useful. You hear those words come out of a child of God. Oh, Lord, come quickly. In other words, we know that's going to be the end to our struggles. Paul has told us so. Those of you who are, who are pressed, rest with us. For when the Lord shall descend. I look forward to his coming. I, if I were to go to sleep tonight and he were to come while I was in bed asleep, I would rejoice. If I get three quarters of the way through this sermon and I'm just about to make my point and he comes, I'm ready to go. I really am ready. I don't mean to say that I'm perfect, but I want to see his face so much that I'm happy to go whenever. Now I know there are purposes for us remaining behind. That's why you and I are still here. It's why we weren't translated when we were first saved. That we have a work to do. We have a purpose. He loved the world, so what must you do? You must love the world. He was willing to give that the world might not perish. What about you? We must, we must also be willing to give that the world not perish. That's why this church exists. We are a light. A, a city set on a hill. We meet here every single Sunday. We meet in this place and preach the Word of God. We we have done in past put out tracts and leaflets in all of these places around here. In fact, many of them have been done twice. Brian can tell you he's the one who kept the records of it. Has all the maps that have been marked off. And we told people in those leaflets how they could be saved and that we meet here every Sunday and that we encourage them to come along and, and to enjoy fellowship with, uh, with God's people. So we have a purpose, we know that, but we still long to see the Lord. We want to see Him revealed from heaven. And why? Because when He is revealed, He will be glorified 
in all of his saints. That, that tells you one thing. Every, every person who is looking forward to the Lord's return is going to glorify God when they see him. They're not going to be looking for a place to hide. They're not going to be going, oh, I wonder, you know, did I, did I do that last thing or did I do that other? No. The Bible tells us that they're going to glorify him. It's going to be a glorious return. And not just because it's so spectacular in its, in its appearance, but because it is the Lord of heaven, the Lord of glory coming back. You want to see the one who died for your sins? You're going to see him face to face. You're going to see him come back in power and glory. Ever want to see uh, him raise the dead? You're going to see it. Because those souls that are now with him around his throne are going to get a new glorified body. The Bible says they rise first. And then we which are alive and remain are caught up together. You ever want just to get rid of the sin nature? I'm just, I want to obey him so much. But, but this, this nature constantly fighting against my desires. You ever want to just see that go? You will. It's going to happen in that day. Is there any, any wonder why the saints will not be rejoicing? Wow. We're going to see the face and the works and the mighty strength of the one who saved us to the uttermost, who gave up glory to come to earth to walk among us as a man and to die that in, indignity of a death on the cross, hated and despised of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but not when he comes the second time. When he comes the second time with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise and there will be glory, glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ in his saints. Not in all the world, but in his saints. And, my friend, to be admired in all them that believe. This word, uh, this and, which ties these two sentences together, uh, I'll just read that for you here. It's in the latter part of that, that chapter, uh, verse 10. When he shall come, A, to be glorified in his saints, and, he says, and to be admired in all of them that believe. In Greek, there's a certain... Uh, a certain type of connection of words by those, those connective uh, conjunctions. This word and is a very important word because the two verses either side of it are considered uh, an equality. They're considered equally wonderful, equally glorious. And so th there's, a, there's a connection between them. So when it says glorified in all his saints and admired in all of them that believe. That might give you the idea that there's two groups here. There's saints, like an elite group. We're talking about Paul and Peter and those apostles, the people that they really strove for the Lord. And then there's this other group, which are all of his saints, just all, you know, all of them that believe. But that's, that's not the meaning of the term. This term is specific and it's constructed in the Greek language in such a way to say that these two groups are one and the same. Not, not only are they alike, they are identical. In other words, I'm talking about the same group of people. We do this a lot in English as well. We use that word and to, to do the same thing. But when you look at it that way, then you see the full force and meaning of this word. It says here then, uh, to be glorified in, in his saints and also to be admired in all of them who believe. Who are the saints of God? They're the ones who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Different terms to describe the same individuals. Do you mean to say that if I was saved, I'm a saint? Absolutely. Sanctified is the word. And it's not because we've become uh, overly wonderful, but it's because we have been set apart. That's what sanctified means. Uh, you, you may have seen 
certain religious groups set aside things uh, in their in their uh, services and and uh, you know use them for uh, he- for purposes of, of worship but God sets apart his people and you know how by giving them of his spirit his spirit coming into you when you were saved set you apart it sanctified you and you became one of those saints one of the sanctified ones in other words you want to know how well what do you mean by that i mean by that one of them who believe on the lord jesus christ that's the construction there in our words to be admired he said in them that believe that word you you ever wonder what you'll feel when he comes back I've got the words for you right here. It will be wonder. You will marvel. You will be astonished. You will regard him with wonder and reverence. That's what it's going to be like when he comes back. No no doubt, no risk. The Bible tells us exactly what it's going to be like. So we have a reason to rejoice. We're going to be, we will in that day of his coming, be free. Now, not only is he coming to be glorified and to be admired in the saints, in them that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes from, uh, from heaven and is revealed from heaven with his holy angels, but he's also going to do some work as well in the world it says here in the first part of our verse he says and to you who are troubled verse 7 rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels listen to this in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. One thing I want you to note here is that the the destruction is everlasting. And what I'm what I'm telling you is that no soul that is created by God is ever snuffed out. It it never ends. The Bible says that Jesus Christ lighteth every man that cometh into the world, that he gives every man a soul. Because of our sin nature, that that soul is tainted, that life is tainted. And so we need to be saved. We need to be sanctified. We need to be set apart by God. But when he comes again, it is said that he will come to uh, exercise vengeance. And the word vengeance has a has a bad uh, a bad rap because we think of vengeance as you know the guy who um, comes back and he cleans up all of the enemies you know with 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 great destructive power, but the word vengeance actually means just an execution of right and justice. So what if we told you that he's coming back again to exercise justice in the world? That doesn't sound so bad, does it? But vengeance, that, that's, uh, that has a different connotation, doesn't it? But nevertheless, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. It's not up to us to make things right, to, to level this world out. It wasn't up to the Thessalonians to, uh, for those people who were Uh, threatening them and and causing them harm to cause them harm in return it was not up to them to do it what did paul say rest with us vengeance is the lord's he will repay when will he do that paul they said when he returns when he is revealed from heaven when he is unveiled then we will see it but take Take heart, brethren, because the Bible says here that the justice and the judgment will be meted out. Those of you who have trusted in Christ, that justice and judgment has already been meted out onto the Son of God, 
onto Jesus Christ. He paid for our sin with his death. But in that day when the Lord returns, the vengeance will be for those that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and that know not God. So you see there, again, we have a connection. That, that judgment is coming to those who know not God and they are the ones who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is one and the same. People say, well, I believe in God. I just don't know about Jesus Christ. Well, you don't believe in God. And another will say, well, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a book that talks about his life on this earth. As far as, the, as God the Father, I have no knowledge of him. I, I've not heard of him uh, coming to this earth. You don't, you don't have God. You don't have either. The Bible teaches us that if we want to have a relationship with God, we must go through his son, Jesus Christ. There's no other way. You, it can't be set up. Well, I'll bypass Christ and I'll go straight to God. Or I'll go through some other intermediary to God. Uh, you know, maybe through Mary or through some other intermediary. I'll find a way in. There is no other way. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me but by me. You see, there's only one way. There was a song uh, that used to sing as kids. You know, there's only one way, and that is God's way. There's only one truth. It's in his word. There's only one life that's lived in Jesus. One way, one truth, one life lived in the Lord. See, it's simple, isn't it? When you boil everything down, what does this whole big book mean? This big book means that God loves you, that he gave his son to die on the cross for your sins, that he, he came in that manger the first time. It also means that he's coming again in the end of all things. He's going to be revealed. There's gonna be an apocalypse. He's gonna be unveiled. He's going to be admired. And, and, and glorified in them that believe. They're going to desire and rejoice in his coming. But brethren, there's going to be a whole other group of people who are hiding in the rocks and in the dens and in the caves saying, hide us from the face of him who is coming. Because they did not know God and because they did not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are people that are worried about this. They're worried about it because they see it as a challenge to the justice of God. Can God be just? Do you think the penalty sounds a bit stiff? Because people do. People say, wow, everlasting, everlasting judgment, everlasting punishment. Uh, it seems to be too much. And yet, when I was lost, that was exactly where I saw myself. I told you about that. I was, I was worried. When the gospel was first unveiled to me, I wasn't rejoicing. I saw myself as undone. And I knew I needed to be saved because I understood the gospel and what it meant. And there was a horror of darkness on me, a horror. I, I couldn't get it out of my head. I stayed awake for nights trying to say to myself, how can I do this? How can I be right with God? And then of course the gospel was believed on in me. It was nothing that I did. It was all Jesus Christ. It was there all along. But I felt that horror of darkness now, I said, it, does it sound a bit uh, much? Because people are going to say, like they always say, God's unjust. Well, why is he unjust? He's unjust because this person never went to church. This person never heard the gospel. This, this person, you know, 
they, they were just on their own. They were left on their own and they didn't have the opportunity. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says that he loved the world so much. He loved them all so much that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him. The Bible teaches that no man would come to God. People would stay away from God unless he drew them. Unless the Father draw a man, no one would come. That's why when someone comes up and says, you know, Brother Carr, I'm, I'm afraid. I go, really? Why are you afraid? I, I, I'm lost. I, I'm not, I've not been saved. I, I can feel my sins are weighing me down. If I were to die tonight, I know that I wouldn't go to be with the Lord. I, I know his judgments upon me. Do you know what that tells me? That the Father is drawing this one near. Whenever you hear someone talk like that, or when you don't even hear them talk, when they sit in a congregation and, and they, they sit like people do, like, like I did in the congregation, they sit there and they hear it and their facial features do not change one bit, but in their heart they say, I am undone. I am, I am undone. I'm, I'm lost. I'm severed from God. All they think about is the judgment. And it could happen any time. When is the Lord coming back? Any moment. It, it, is a, it is a moment by moment thing. So no wonder there's great fear. So what would we tell someone like this? Well, my friend, God loves you. He so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. If you've been made aware of your sinfulness, that's a good thing. That tells you that the Father is drawing you. His Spirit is working with you to bring you to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so how was I saved from that horrible fear? I looked to Jesus and I saw there in him all of the work finished. Not, not still to be done, not trusting that one day it would happen, but all finished. The suffering, the, the, the perfect life, the death on the cross, the third day resurrected from the dead. I saw it all. And I said, oh God, forgive me, save me. Jesus died. You love me. You gave your only begotten son to die. Forgive my sins and give me everlasting life. You know what he did? He heard my prayer. He attended unto my cry. He pressed the button and saved. He set me apart, sanctified me, put me on a new path, put a new man in my heart. So much so that I got up from my knees from, from going down scared and afraid to going up wishing I could just be caught straight away. I wish I could have gone that day and been caught straight up into his presence because I was glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. It was great glory. Now, are you here today? Are you worried, first of all, are you worried that God's not just that he's going to allow someone to be condemned without them being guilty? Absolutely not. God, God understands men. That's why he sent his son. He knew there was none righteous, not, not one single person. He knew that even saving me, that I could do nothing to save you because I didn't save myself. He saved me. It was his work. He's done all of the work. Don't think that God is unjust. Don't think that that's a, that's a big penalty for such a little crime. It's not a little, it's not a small thing. It's an antidote for the evil that rests with man. It says here, who obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. That word punished means to pay for a wrong done. And, you know, that's what happens when you go to court and you're found guilty of a crime and they put you in jail or they fine you. It's a payment of a penalty that has been adjudged as having been committed. Everlasting destruction. What, what will the destruction be? Well, here are two terms to describe it. This should be enough. From the presence of the Lord. How about that? Always severed from the presence of the Lord. No hope. Without hope. And lastly, from the glory of his power. That glory is going to be displayed on that day. That glory will be wondrous. The power and, and, and the, the glory, just, just in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says, at the last trump, the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise. And fates are sealed, brethren. Fates are sealed. Time is up. There will be time like that no longer. But remember this, that the God who brings judgment is also the one who loves the world and delays his coming, was not willing that any should perish and was willing to send his only begotten son into the world to die on a cross for sinners such as us. And, and he's delayed his coming, hasn't he? He didn't, he didn't come, you know, when I was uh, 15 or 16. If he had done, I would have been lost. He delayed his coming. And then the gospel came to me like a lightning bolt from heaven. You know, I'd heard about the gospel and I'd heard about God and all of those things about. But one day it came to me. That was the Father drawing me. I didn't come immediately. Maybe you didn't either. I didn't come immediately. I, pet, I played it tough. I toughed it out. And I paid the price for that with uh, several days of pain and suffering, thinking in my own mind that I had to get back to church to be saved because I thought that's where it happens. That's the only place where I've ever heard them give an, an invitation to come. Little did I know I could have called on the Lord right there where I was. He would have heard me. But he was merciful and he delayed. And so that Wednesday night I was saved. I was, I was rejoicing and I still am rejoicing. Even thinking about it makes me rejoice. And perhaps you're here the same way. You've toughed it out. Maybe it was when you were very young you heard the gospel and it rang true in your heart. You know, God never lets you forget those things. Those are memories you never lose. Never lose them. All the days of your life, you'll never lose them because the Lord will occasionally bring you back to that thought and bring you back to that day. And he'll remind you of that word. Are you here today and you've, you have heard that gospel message and it rang true to your heart and you thought, I am undone, I need to be saved. But you haven't been? This is the time. This is a transaction not to be done with a pastor or with a deacon or, or with, uh, you know, someone on a, on a telephone. This is a transaction between you and God. And the work that we're claiming, because we're all saved by works, we're claiming the work of Jesus Christ, not our own work. Our works are not sufficient. Oh, it's his work. That's why we can confidently come. He loves us. He sent his son. He draws us. And he makes the way available through Jesus Christ. That's why we can come. And, and on top of all of that, he's delayed his coming to make it possible for us to be here. So if you're here today and saved, you can stand in great glory and wonder and look at his return and say, I can't wait. How long, O oh Lord? How long? And if you're here today and lost, 
then brethren, you need not wait one second longer. Christ has the antidote. He's offering it in love, offering it to every man. And this is your time to call on him.